Good morning, Victory. Nine o'clock. That's early on a Sunday, and you guys are all alive, and um, really great to be here with you, and Pastor Larry, Linda, great um, honor to be able to preach this morning, and um, looking forward to what God's going to do. And so, if you have a Bible with you, we're going to be in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. You guys are in a series called Beyond Blessed, and I had the chance um, this week to listen to Pastor Larry's message from last week, which, if you were here, he talked about um, how God is the owner of it all, right? That God is Lord over everything. All that we have, all that we are is His. And so when the Bible teaches us that Jesus is Lord over all, that means that he's in charge of all of our lives, right? And that includes our finances. And so when we give our lives to Jesus, how many people you've already committed your life to Jesus? Would you just raise your hand? When when that happens in our lives, our relationship to money changes, Right? That, that's one of the things that God does. We, we go from being owners of what we have to being stewards of what God has given to us. And so that means that we are no longer in control. Right? I, I think a lot of times we say God is Lord of all, but in all reality, we really have to ask ourselves, is God truly Lord of all? of all of my life, right? Not just one part, not my Sunday morning from uh, 9 to 10.30, uh, whatever it is. Is Jesus really Lord of all? And if he is, that means that our finances are included in that lordship. And so now it becomes, God, what do you want me to do with this part of my life? Right, Just like any other part that Jesus is Lord of. God, what do you want me to do? And what happens is because we give our lives to Jesus, we start wanting to be like him more. Right? And how many know that Jesus, by nature, God is a giver? For God so loved the world that he, what? That he gave. And so when we give our lives to God, we start to take on that 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 nature, we want to be like God. We want to be able, there's a desire more than anything we had before, right? Even if you were the most, you know, giving person before you came to Christ, when you give your life to God, all of a sudden, you want, you have a desire to be a blessing. How many want to be a blessing? Amen. Right? You want to be, when you see somebody in need, maybe Pastor Larry takes an offering for a missionary, whatever it is, and we, there's something in us. We want, we want to give to that. We, there's a desire that we all have to want to give, and that's part of being a Christian. And what I want to talk to you this morning about is we have a desire to do it, but we can't many times. And we can't, not because we don't make enough money. We can't, not because we uh, don't have the, the best job. We can't because we spend more than what we have. We want to, right? I believe every person, if you're at church at nine in the morning, you want to live for God. Amen. Okay? I, I barely made it myself, and I'm preaching. But you're here because you want to live for God. You want to do something. You want your life to count. And many times, even as a Christian, we're saved, but our finances backslide. How many know what I'm talking about? How many ever had that happen? Like, I'm serving Jesus, but my checking account is not. Right? And what happens is we want to, but we can't. Why? Is it because you don't have the best job? No, because we spend more than we have. And so when we want to give, we can't give. And it's a horrible place to be. And I want you to know two things before I read our text. Number one, I've been there. There have been seasons in my life where if I'm being totally transparent and honest, right, where I have not honored God with my finances. Can I get an amen here? Amen. I'm saved, but I, my money wasn't. 
when it comes to stewardship, right? My bad stewardship, it, it prohibited me from being able to do what God wanted me to do with my life. And the second thing I want us to know this morning, no matter where you fall in what I just said, there is hope. There is hope for every person here, no matter how deep in debt you are, no matter what your financial condition is, no matter how big of a hole that you happen to be, I want you to know that there is hope because we serve Jesus Christ. And I want to share a testimony of my own life at the end of this sermon and kind of tell you why I believe there's hope. Money does not, listen to me here, money does not have to be mysterious. Like, I wonder why they have some and I don't, right? You don't have to go through your whole life wondering how, what's the secret to money? There are some really, really practical things that God's word gives us to steward our money. So I want to read out of 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 11, if you'll follow along with me. 1 Timothy chapter 6 beginning in verse 6 down to verse 11. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Wow. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And this is the famous verse. We're all familiar with this one. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. In verse 11, but as for you. I love that. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Father, we thank you for your word. It is your word. You tell us in your word, it is as we behold you that we are changed, that we are transformed. God, I pray for that transforming power as we look to your word today to come in, speak to us, God, bring hope, God, correction if need be, Lord, I pray that we be challenged, God, not just hear the words, God, but that we would be doers of your word. I pray financial blessing upon this church, every family, every household, God, we believe you for it, and all of God's people said, Amen. I want to talk about, first of all, the contention that Paul makes in our scripture. And I, I think for, if we're honest, most of us, if, we, if we're really honest, the, this verse right here is really hard for us to swallow. Verse 8, but if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. I didn't get one amen or even a noise. Amen. But if we have food and clothing... <laughs> America, if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. That's the contention that Paul is making in our text. Where, let me ask you, where besides right here would you ever hear that spoken in our society? Where would you, besides the word of God, where would you ever find someone at a, at a self-help conference, at a financial, if you just have clothing and food, you should be content. They would be booed off the stage. And if we're honest, it's hard to swallow a little bit because we live in America where everything is against that, right? Because we're taught from an early age, don't be content with what you have. Be discontent. Don't be content with your marriage. Be discontent with your marriage. Maybe I got to preach on marriage next Sunday. And then you, you add to that the, our own fallen nature, which by nature, uh, i.e. the garden, the fall, never happy with what we get. 
And then every commercial that we hear, we're surrounded on an everyday basis, every advertisement at an every turn, buy this, you need this, upgrade this. And I, I mean, I, all of I'm, I want to, I'm preaching to today and I wish, you know, I had this all figured out and sussed out, but I'm just preaching from my heart. I'm going to share where my own journey with money, but I want to tell you that it's been me that comes home with, I already have a newer iPhone. I'm trying to convince my wife, I need the new one, honey. <laughs> Why? Well, it has, you should see the camera it has. She's like, you're an idiot. You don't even take pictures. <laughs> What does it matter? Well, you don't get it. You, I don't have to come up with a 1200 up front. You can do, you know, 60 years of 399 a month. And we do it. We upgrade. Why? Because what we have isn't good enough. Ooh, I love it when it gets quiet preaching, Pastor Larry. How many times are you totally fine with what you have until you see someone else come in with something different and better? <laughs> it's like, I need that now. You, you didn't five minutes ago. And we get so, this is what's crazy about us as Americans. We get so excited to go into debt. It's crazy. And that's just one, like this is just one of the many things that we don't need that society has convinced us that we have to have the latest and the greatest. And you know what happens, church, before too long? We find ourselves in over our heads financially. It doesn't take that long. Trust me, the companies know that, right? That's why every commercial pretty much put it on credit. Don't worry about it. You don't have the money now? Don't worry about it. I, I'm going to age myself a little bit right here. But um, when I was growing up, we had a store called Bradley's. Does anybody, is, you guys have Bradley's? You know, Brad, okay, so Bradley's, I think it was in the Northeast. It, basically, it was like an upgraded version of Kmart. Okay, but my family, I'm the youngest of five. We didn't have all the finances in the world. But at Bradley's when I was a kid, every Christmas, we'd have our Christmas list and my mother would go to Bradley's and she would shop our list. And I'm going to blow some of you away. And at the end of the cart being full of stuff, she would dr drive it up, not drive it. She'd roll it up to the cashier and they would ring it all up and she would put it on what is called layaway. I've just lost everybody under 35. <laughs> what is layaway means I can't afford to buy it right now, so I'm going to come back every week and put $30 on it. And at Christmas time, right before Christmas, like the day before, all the moms run to Bradley's where their husbands gave them that final 50 bucks and they can get the presents and Christmas will be great. There, I don't think there is a, a such thing as layaway right now in our world. No one lays anything away. It's get it now. Worry about it later. You don't have the money. It used to be if you didn't have the money that you would wait to get it. Hello. Today it is put it on a card. So let's talk about the contrast, secondly, that I believe Paul is making in our text. He says in verse 9, listen to it again, but those who desire to be rich, and I know right there some of you are like, oh, pastor, I don't desire to be rich. Shut up. <laughs> you live in America, so that's like part of our DNA. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless credit cards and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and I would say financial destruction. This is what God thinks when we go after what the world is selling. God says it's, it's a trap. You need to listen to me. And if you've never been in debt, let me tell you what debt feels like. It feels like death. 
It feels like a trap. There is stress and anxiety. Listen, marital stress, just add debt to that. And the word of God says it is harmful and it can plunge our lives into ruin and destruction. I want us to listen to Matthew 6. And it's a familiar verse, but it really came alive to me when I was getting ready for this sermon this week. Matthew 6, verse 24. We've all familiar if you've been saved for any amount of time. It says this in verse 24. No one. Can you say that with me? No one. Say it like you're mad at your wife. No one. No one can serve two masters. You know what no one means in the Greek? No one. <laughs> Including you. No one can serve two masters. But I can. I can do it, Pastor. I can go after the world and serve. No one can serve two masters for either he'll hate the one and love the other or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money or mammon. I've read these verses. I preached out of them literally so many times and I've always thought of the classic rich guy we all can think of someone maybe even that comes to church right now that they're never able to be a part of anything they miss church service after church service because they're too busy chasing the American dream that's really what I always have thought about when it's talking about serving God and money because we don't really think we serve God and money right but this is what I really feel like God was saying there are a lot of Christians who want to serve God but they can't because money controls them. And not all the time, listen to me, when it says no one can serve money and God, it's not always that you have so much money that you can't serve God. A lot of times it is that your relationship to money is so twisted that you're so in over your head that you can't serve God because of money. And we become slaves to it. Proverbs 22, verse 7. Listen to this. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is a slave to the lender. So when you try to keep up with the Joneses, this is what you're doing. You're enslaving yourself. The rich rules over the poor. Like, that's why they call, when they call you looking for their money, don't raise your hand if that's ever happened. And you're like, me no speak English. Me no copy hende. Oh, we know it's you, Mr. Canto. They're not worried. The, the, the lender, the, the credit card, they, they're all set. It's your stress. You've got to worry about it. And you become a slave. And you know what I know about slaves? When someone is a slave, the only thing that can help them is for someone else to set them free. And that is what Jesus wants to do with our finances. Listen to this, John 8, verse 31. So so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. How many want to be a disciple of Jesus? If you abide, right? If you listen, if you are listening to me today and then you actually do it. And what does it say? And you will know the truth And how many know truth sometimes can hurt? I have been on the hurt side of this sermon a lot in my life. If you know the truth, what happens? The truth will set you free. And so the Bible says that when we get into debt, we become slaves. We're in bondage. And the power of Jesus' word is that he wants to deliver us from the taskmaster. He wants to deliver us from this bondage. And so this is one thing I think we need to know. The Bible teaches us, write this down, that we will never be free if we're in debt. That was exciting. The Bible says we will never be free if we're in debt. Someone else tells you you want to give. 
You want to be liberal, you want to be generous, but you can't because at the end of the month, someone else is telling you where your money's going. I'm going to talk about the cure then, finally. Listen to our text again in verse 6. But godliness with contentment. I love that. Because the sermon title is The Great Gain, right? The, America, the great gain is the big house and the multiple garages and, you know, a vacation home. That's the great gain. Live for that. But listen to what the great gain is in the Word of God. Godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Amen. So Paul says, here's the cure for discontentment. You ready? Yeah. Contentment. That's the cure. Someone said these words, there are two ways to be rich. One is to have all that you want. The other is to be satisfied with what you have. There's two ways to be rich. One is to have all that you want, and very few of us will ever get there. And let me just say, when the millionaires get there, there's still something missing in their life. One is to get all that you want. Spend your life pursuing the love of money. Get it all. Or the other is to be content with what you have. Stop buying things that you think will bring you contentment. When in fact, all they do, listen to me, this is the rabbit, is that a word, rabbit race or rabbit trail, whatever it is. This is the rabbit hole of discontentment. You try to get stuff to make yourself more content, and the more you get, the more discontent you are. But godliness with contentment is great gain. And I love this. Anytime you're studying the Bible, reading it, anytime there's a because or a for, pay attention. Godliness with contentment is great gain for For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. That's the reason why, right? Paul says, be careful, listen to me, be careful if your whole life is about what you get and what you can acquire in this world, because you might end up waking up on the other side with nothing, Because you're not taking your car, your house, your bank account. So Paul says, be careful that you don't spend your life pursuing the wrong thing. Pursue godliness, church. See, what God is trying to do, he's trying to warn us in a world that is trying to get us to take the bait. God is warning us as his kids. He's saying, don't fall into the trap. So I want to give us some practical things as we close that Paul tells us to do. Number one, we need to stop embracing what the world is telling us and start trusting what God's word says to us. That's how. That's how we become content. We've got to stop embracing what the world says and start trusting what God's word says. Isn't that what happened in the garden? Who said that you shouldn't touch this tree? And see, God is saying this is where debt leads to. This is where, when Pastor Larry told me the subject of not keeping up with the Joneses, this is what happens when you try to spend your life keeping up with the Joneses. And because God says, I love you, how many believe that God wants the absolute best for us? That means, listen, church, that means we can trust his word over how we feel, over what the world is saying. And listen, whatever God has is always far better than anything the world would ever be able to give to us. That's why we can trust him. Are we going to trust, listen, are we going to trust what he says? When he says, it's just be content with food and clothing. When he says just godliness with contentment is great gain, are we going to trust his word? 
And this is one of the things I really want us to know about contentment. Contentment is not simply about settling for what you have. Because some of you are saying, well, that's easy for you to say. You probably have more than me. No, no, no. You, you miss the message of contentment. Contentment is not simply about settling for what we have. Contentment is about trusting in what God has said. You see the difference? So that means you can be content in any situation. Isn't that what Paul said? I've learned in every season of life to be content. I didn't give you this verse, but I thought of this verse this morning. Hebrews 13, verse 5 to 6. Listen to this in case they can't pull it up. Hebrews 13, verse 5 to 6. Keep yourself, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Here's the four again, comma, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What a verse. Keep your life free from the love of money. Why? Just because you want to? No, 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 no. Just because it comes easy? Nope. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have for he will never leave you or forsake you. Be content with what you have. Are there six more terrifying words to us? Be content with what you have. Don't let your heart endlessly crave what you might have one day, but cultivate satisfaction. That's what contentment is. Satisfaction in what God has already given to you. And I don't know if you know this yet, God has already given you himself. That is the basis. Listen to me, church. That is the basis of contentment. See, we'll only be truly content when we, we understand who we have in Christ. The second thing I, I believe that God teaches us in this text is stop doing the same thing and expecting different results. How many have ever gotten to debt and said, I'll never do that again? Raise your hand. How many have done it again? You know what Paul says? Flee. You know another verse, flee fornication? We don't think about money that way, do we? Run away from it. Stop. Stop making the same bad decisions with money. Flee from it. Flee from it like you would any other sin. So the starting place is to stop. Well, pastor, I'm in over my head. What can I do? Stop. Repent. Stop making the bad decision. And God will begin to help you to get out of debt. If you're bleeding financially today, I want you to know that you're one stop away from everything being turned around in your life. And you can be the giver that you want to be. Verse 10, it says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. I love that. That's the root. How many want to get to the root today? The root, the origin, the love of money. And I think for the most part, none of us think that we do love money. Love, you know what it does? It makes you do irrational things. You know what they say, love is blind? Right? It's blind because you just do irrational things. Pastor, I want to get married to her. I love her. How long have you known her? A week. <laughs> love is blind. They also say that love is blind and marriage helps you to regain your focus. <laughs> when we're in love, we do irrational things. I love you. Like, I want you to know this about me. If you get nothing else out of this message, you need to know this about Joe Canto. Joe Canto loves Tom Brady. <laughs> loves him. Love, I mean, absolutely in love with Tom Brady. I got a picture of him in my family room. I've got a helmet signed. I've got, I'm in love with Tom Brady. You know what love does? It causes you to do irrational things. Like when they had the Super Bowl parade 
in the middle of February or the end of February and it's 36 degrees and raining and you get up at 4.30 in the morning because you want to get a front row seat to see Tom Brady go by for 10 seconds and you sit outside for six hours, that's what love will cause you to do. You know what your love will cause you to do? Ignore the severity of your decisions because you're in love with money. It causes you to do irrational things. Trust me, you have something that you love in your life. But as for you, man of God, I love that. How many want to be a man or a woman of God? Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. So it's not just what we stop doing. Listen to me, if you just stop getting into debt, you haven't figured this out yet. It's not just about getting financially secure. No, no, no. Start pursuing what God has for your life. He says, start pursuing, here it is, a relationship with God because then your contentment will be solved for the rest of your life. Verse 17, if you're still there, 1 Timothy 6. I want us to read this and I'm closing. As for the rich in this present age, And if you're in America, he's talking to you. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. I love that. You see it? Who richly provides us with everything. Do you believe that he does? Everything to enjoy. They are to do good to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of which is truly life. I love that. Command those in this world that are rich to do what? Be ready to be generous. If you want to break, listen to me, if you want to break the power of the love of money in your life, make a decision today, I'm going to be generous. If you have zero dollars, you can start being generous with your time, your energy, and your talents. This is how we break the hole, that slavery that holds us in bondage. We start sharing with what we have, right? That's always the issue. I don't have time to get into it. All through the Bible, it's always what do you have, not what do you want, not what are you looking for. God always says, what do you have right now? Give it to me. Break the power of money in your life by deciding I'm going to be generous, and that can start today. All of us can start being generous today. Start sharing now. I believe it was about five years ago when I came to the first... Um, Go conference, maybe about five years ago, Pastor Larry invited me. And I'll never forget it. I don't know why, but during that weekend of ministry, my wife and I really felt like we needed to go full time into ministry. I don't know if it was a conversation with Pastor Larry, but at the time we, um, we had got ourselves into debt. We were doing a renovation on our house. And, you know, obviously, obviously anytime you start a renovation, things cost more than you plan. And so they ended up going on the credit card, right? Beautiful kitchen, everything looks great, but we were in debt. And it was a significant amount of money. And I'll never forget, it was Pastor Cement preached that Sunday morning on money. I don't know if you remember that. And he pulled an altar call, and I, I, I texted my wife to confirm, but I, I remember coming up right over here, we decided, like, God, if you can make a way for us to get out of debt... Like, I mean, I'm talking twenty, thirty thousand dollars not just like a couple thousand, like significant amount of money. God, we came up, we pledged our lives to God. If you can make a way, we don't have a way to get out of this. There's no way. We don't have the kind of money. We got ourselves in debt, but we love you. How many love God here today? See, that's what God's looking for. And we said, We're, if you can help us, God. If you can help us, please. And we came up, we prayed, and and Pastor Cement prayed for the people that were there. And I remember it was within a few weeks or a month that all of a sudden I started to get all these side jobs. 
All this extra income that we had not planned for and we were able to get out of debt in a, in a relatively short amount of time. Listen to me, why do I share that with you? I share it because sometimes when we hear messages like this, we can feel hopeless, but I want you to know that the God that we serve loves us. He cares about us. And if you will commit your life to him, he can do a miracle in your finances. If we admit and say, God, help my bad stewardship. I repent of what I've done. I want to honor you. I want to be a blessing. And God saw us in that altar call, began to help us. And I want to tell you today that God wants to help every family, every couple, every young person, teenager, whoever you are today. Your relationship to money is important. Why? Because God says it's this. And God is looking for our hearts. I wonder today, you're here and you're saying, God is convicting me. He's dealing with me about my relationship to money. I want you to know today can be the beginning of a brand new start financially. See, it's one thing to know that he's owner of all. Like we learned last week, it's a whole different thing to behave like he's owner of all. God, this is your money. It's not my house. It's not my finances. They're yours. And I want to take care of them the way that you called me to. Let's just bow our heads today. Thank you, Jesus. And I know that this message was not necessarily a, a message of the gospel, but there is the gospel here. Right? Because God is a giver. That's why when we give our lives to him, something begins to happen and we could be the most selfish, stubborn, self-willed people in the world. And when we give our lives to God, all that begins to change. If that's not happening, you've got to question whether or not you've truly given your life to Jesus. And I want to tell you, I, I guarantee you there are people here today, you're not a Christian, you don't know God. You've never, maybe you've first time in a church like this ever hearing about God and his love and his plan for your life can I tell you the good news is for God so loved the world that he gave his son he gave him why because our sin is what the Bible calls separates us from God Right, Romans 6, 23, the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. That's a gift today, and he wants you. Listen, you're here today. Someone's invited you. You've come in by invitation. You've heard about the church. We do all of this. All of this happens. All the support, all the ministries today, we are here because we want you to know God's love and his forgiveness, and he has a plan for your life, and the starting place is to admit your need for him and invite him in as your Lord, and I would have no greater honor today to lead you in a prayer of doing that. If that is you today, would you raise your hand this morning? You're not a Christian. You're not saved. You don't know Christ, but you want to. Maybe you're backslidden for whatever reason. You've kind of wandered away. Maybe this is your first time back in months. Just happened to come in today. Listen, there's no happenstance in the kingdom. There's no coincidence. God orchestrates everything. He is sovereign over all. And he knew that you'd be here today. And he's calling you. He's drawing you in his love into a relationship. And if that's you, you want to come home today. God loves you. He loves you. Would you raise your hand today? You want to give your life to Jesus. There's one. Anybody else? Join this one, two. Anybody else? Anybody else? Three. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Listen, I, I want to, every head bowed still. I'll give me 30 more seconds. The problem with preaching a message like this is that if we're honest, many times we're on the wrong side of this message. And there have been seasons in my life where I'm like, saved, God, I love you, but my finances, like, what is it? Why do I keep falling for this trap? Why do I keep getting myself into this jam? I know better. 
I, I, I know your word. I, I, you know, it's not like a, an issue of knowledge. Listen, but it's an issue of trust. Money has to do with trust. Are we going to trust God or not? And when he says, I want to be your all in all, that he is the sufficiency of my life. When he says, I want to be at the heart of who you are. I want your, con your contentment to be in me and through me. When he says you can be content with what you have, no matter how little you have, what a challenge that is to our lives. And I believe that the antidote, right, the cure, is not just, okay, I'm going to stop. Okay, pastor, you got me. I'm not going to do it anymore. I don't want to be in debt. No, 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 no. If you got that, you missed the heart of this message. It is way bigger than that. It is seeing God's heart that he wants to bless you. He doesn't want destruction, right? He, don't, he doesn't want embarrassment. He doesn't want these things to come on your life. And he's giving you the answers. And he says, pursue, flee that and pursue me and I will give you all that you need. And so it's perhaps for the Christians that are here, this altar call that we're going to respond would just be you saying, God, I'm going to pursue you. Maybe you're in the condition that my wife were in five years ago. You need to grab your wife's hand, your husband, and come down and pray. Say, God, do a miracle. Maybe it's repentance. Maybe I'm, my relationship to money is wrong. I haven't been treating it the way that I should. And because I can't be generous. Whatever it is, I, I believe in altar calls, church. I believe that when we respond together, God shows up. It's different in your chair. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's different when we collectively, as a group of believers, come down and say, I'm on board. I'm changing. I'm pursuing what God has for my life. Those three hands, you raised your hand for salvation. Would you look at me? Quickly look at me. I see that hand. Anybody else? One over here. There's a few. Another one, brother in the back. We want to pray with you. I see you there in the red shirt. Could you stand? Could you come on up? There's a few. The rest of us, let's stand to our feet. Would you come forward? We're going to have an altar worker pray with you. We're going to pray. Could I challenge you to make a decision this morning in your finances to invite God in? We're going to sing a song as we do. There was another sister here. Come on forward. We're going to pray. One more. Was there one more? Glory to God. Can we give God a clap offering for this church? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I just want you to raise your hands, right, to heaven. It's, a, it's an act of surrender because he's Lord, right? You're saying, when we do this, we're saying, God, you're Lord. I give up. I surrender my life. I've tried to do it on my own. I couldn't. I'm in the condition I'm in because I've tried. And so this means I surrender. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, say Lord Jesus. Say it out loud. Lord Jesus. I thank you for giving your life. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner, that I'm lost without you. I believe that you came and you gave your life for my sins. I confess my sins to you. And today, I choose to make you Lord of my life. I surrender my heart, my affections, and my future. From this day forward, I will serve you with all of my heart. In Jesus' name.